Professor Jill Farrant is a pioneering and internationally renowned plant biologist. Battling alcohol addiction years back, she put herself into rehab and emerged invigorated. When I left rehab, I threw myself into my work with passion and I made a change in research direction as a consequence, really, of reading an article on, on resurrection plants. The author termed the plants resurrection plants because they seemed to resurrect from a dead, dry state. I remembered as a child that I'd, I'd noticed this resurrection phenomenon, plants being very, very dry and then it rains, and the next day they're green, but the rest of the felt is dry. As a child, I wrote it down in my diary, but I, <laughs> on reading the article, the second, I thought, I wonder if that was just what I really did see as a child. And I went back, found the diary, and found the plant. And that's when it all started. On that very trip, I collected some Bobbianstad, I collected some, some of the other species I work on. And the greenhouses got filled and I literally took off. It was a field where no one had worked much beforehand. I had a beautiful source of plants, an amazing vision to work towards, and all the renewed energy of being clean and sober. Well, one of the first things I wanted to do once I saw these plants is to actually watch them do it. So I dried them down and I put on a camera and I watered them and I just watched what happened as they rehydrated. What's it like to watch the plants that look so dry and so dead just open up, just green out in such a short period of time? Lisa, one of the things that everyone says to me is, you've watched these videos how many times? And every time you look at them, your face lights up. <laughs> it is just an amazing phenomenon. And I wanted to understand everything about how these plants dry down and don't die. She's absolutely driven. And I think in the main it's because of the impact that her research is going to have on the world. If you look at what's happening in the coming century, I think Jill's work will be of phenomenal importance and will have an impact given the availability of water resources, which is going to come up in this century, as well as, of course, the drought, that the impending and rather dramatic uh, breakout of drought around the world in the century. So for Jilly, it's very important that her work gets out there. Papers came out quite quickly. And, and so I slowly started to build cred. As that happened and people reached out in collaboration with me, I started to collaborate with people around the world. And it, it started to be, in a sense, me going to people saying, look, you're an expert in, in lipid signals. I've got some cool plants. Would you like to work with me? And literally, leaps and bounds. She's a kook. <laughs> she's, um, she's definitely not the typical academic, that's for sure. She's got a completely different perspective on life from other people. You know, if, if she can actually realise her goals, it, it will be world changing, I think. For the next 10 years, I threw myself into work. I became a head of department. I could not say no. I took on every single chairing committee that I could possibly take on. Editorial ships, I was working myself into a frenzy. And really, I think, it sounds like a cliche, I was an accident waiting to happen. Jill's partner, Helena, understands this drivenness. She knows where it comes from and watches it play out in Jill's life, even today. She will work at the university for hours and come home and work, but then again, that's Joel, the people pleaser. She wants to make sure everyone, everyone else is okay before she would take time for herself. And I would just sometimes say, Joel, breathe. In my usual frenetic, rushing, everyday life, I um, ran into the bathroom, slipped, and fell, hit my head on the corner of the bath, and ended up in hospital with a subdural brain bleed. Apparently had about one to four hours left to live. But in the consequence of all of that, I've lost um, my sense of smell and taste. And I'll never ever get that back again. It's not the most um, difficult one to lose, but it has consequences. If you can't taste your food, you firstly, um, you don't feel like eating much, but you can do things like pick up alcohol without realizing. I went to a party 
uh, where I picked up a drink with alcohol in, not knowing that there was alcohol in, I thought it was pure orange juice. And um, within about 20 minutes of drinking that, I knew exactly what had happened. And I went out and bought another bottle of wine on my way home. That's how quickly it affected me after 10 years of not drinking. It was instant fix, I wanted more. She's always been very open about her drinking, about being an alcoholic, but then obviously when she relapsed, it became obviously much more of an issue. We just started to notice that she wasn't coming to university as much as she, she usually was around. I was so absent from the lab. There were days I'd get up and I'd just hit the bottle. The, the difficult and the most harrowing thing was, will she come back and how long will it take for her to get back? And do I have the emotional reserves left um, to not abandon her? Because for Jill, abandonment is very real. Jill went to Paris. It was a way of escaping and being able to drink freely without explaining herself to others. And it was there that she hit rock bottom. Within three months, I got to a point where I ended up in a Paris hospital, thinking I had had a stroke. She was completely and absolutely in an alcoholic funk, for want of a better word. And to see this frail little sparrow with all these um, tubes and the nursing staff and um, the, dis the general dishevelment of Jill, um, and the difficulty around looking at this, this, this person who's really slipping away. It felt like she was slipping away. I was lying there, thinking about what the hell have I done to my life? And I made a deal with God that I would serve him. I was so desperate. I was so desperate. I was bargaining for my life at that point. And I think the first next step was rehab. I had to put myself into rehab to get to the point where I could actually just live a normal life, um, alcohol-free, and start again. didn't follow through on my deal with God. I threw myself into work. I was walking in the forest, probably more devastated than I had been for ages. I just heard that a research grant that I'd put in had been rejected. I had no more funding left. And um, I was ready to give up, literally, just give up. I had no money for the students, for my work, for project. What's the point? What's the point of carrying on if you have nothing to carry on with or for. And um, I was challenged not to give up that day. I was standing looking at a particular tree. I thought, wow, that's beautiful. And the voice came to me and said, your problem is, Jill, you don't have faith in your own abilities as a scientist. Have faith in me and let's see what happens. I knew with his help, I could use my skills to possibly roll out this drought tolerant crop, but it requires a lot of faith. Faith in my skills and faith that he'll help me. It was phenomenal. She was literally rejuvenated and rejigged in a way. And for her, this epiphany was so unexpected. She was in a state of complete joy. You took a leap of faith. What was it? I made a leap of faith. I made a leap of faith that I can do this. I can, I can stand up again, face the world, do my research. I am capable. He's just told me that. <laughs> 